Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another episode of T for C. I don't need to tell any of you that the cost of a college education today, let alone a grad school degree, is astronomical. And so it probably won't surprise you to learn that the U.S. now has more student loan debt than credit card debt. Well, my next guest has been in the business of higher education for decades now and is going to help all of us to better understand why a college degree is so mind-bogglingly expensive. But before I introduce you to John Katzman, a serial entrepreneur in what's known as educational technology or ed tech, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's Time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive peek inside the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number 4 coffeeorg and sign up. And while you're there, you can search for the episodes and the professionals you most want to listen to by career, whether it's architecture and design, or as is the case with my next guest, higher education and teaching. The boxes are right there on the homepage. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is John Katzman, an education entrepreneur. John is the founder and CEO of the Noodle Companies, which connects learners, educators, and technology. Prior to that, he founded and ran 2U, which helps research universities create and administer high-quality online degree programs. And before that, he founded and ran the Princeton Review way back in 1981, which for almost the last 40 years has been helping students find, get into, and pay for higher ed. John is the co-author of five books and has served as a trustee of several for-profit and non-profits, including Renaissance Learning, the National Association of Independent Schools, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the National Alliance of Public Charter Schools. By the way, if you want to learn more about how to break into the field of ed tech, check out the show notes for this episode to see if our Espresso Shots episode has already dropped. John, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I've got my Diet Coke right here and I am ready to go. Awesome. And thanks for having me. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, we should also let our listeners know that you have been super flexible with trying to do this interview. We were having some technical issues earlier in the week, and you're doing it on a Sunday afternoon, which is just so nice. Not only a Sunday afternoon, but a Sunday afternoon in late July. My goodness, you should have something even better than a Diet Coke in your hand at this time. (laughs) We'll get halfway through and I'll switch. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So, John, I'm going to want to get into what has happened in higher education since you and I were undergrads a little bit later in our interview, and especially why you think it's actually easier to get into a good college today if you're strategic in the way you go about the application process. But first, I was hoping to do things a little differently in this interview. And that is rather than starting with what you're doing today with noodle companies, I would like really because there's been a progression to what you've done in your professional life, and it's all been in roughly the same field. I was thinking we could start with your first baby, the Princeton Review, which you launched in 1981. Is that right? Yep. So the Princeton Review, of course, is still around and thriving. So how does a guy who started out majoring in electrical engineering and computer science and then pivots to become an architecture major end up starting an education-related company? I tutored when I was in college just to make spending money and loved it. I loved the students. I loved the problem of helping them understand what they were good at, what they were bad at, and address the problems. The test itself was kind of a puzzle. And the thing about standardized tests, unlike a lot of the teaching world, you don't have to motivate anybody. Like 
the students were plenty motivated. And so you could really just spend your time teaching. So when I graduated, I just thought, well, that'd be a fun thing to do for a couple of years and maybe build a company and sell it to raise some money to start a software company. And then Prince of Reeves kind of did well and I went with it. We should tell our listeners that you went to Princeton. So that's kind of the backstory on the name. It is, although people knew the testing company, the educational testing service, as Princeton back then. And so we were the prep for that. Okay. I'm not sure I follow that. Oh, just that if you spoke to, you know, back in the day, if you spoke to a college admissions person, she might well refer to ETS as Princeton as opposed to thinking that you meant the university. Let me call Princeton to get your scores. So it was just the locus of the testing world. Got it. So that was not your company, though. The testing company? No. But I had it in mind when I named Princeton Review. Okay. And when you started the company, there was already another company out there that had kind of cornered the market. That was the Kaplan Test Prep, right? Yes. They had a reputation. In a sense, what prep meant back then was kind of C students preparing so that they looked more like B students. Right. It was it was something you did that you would never even admit that you did. Whereas my conception of test prep was, no, these are really good students. Their scores aren't quite where they want them, but they're applying to really good schools. And the thought of not prepping for an important test is bizarre to me and was bizarre to me. So the thinking was, I want you wearing my T-shirt. I want you, you know, I, it's a party every weekend. And it's a bunch of students from all over the place getting together and taking on this test together. So how much of what you just said is John Katzman, the marketing genius whiz, and how much of it was the reality? Because to be perfectly honest, I remember taking a Kaplan test prep and I wasn't a C student. So how (laughs) was it? I mean, with all due respect, how was it that you, obviously a smart guy who had just graduated from college and knew nothing about business, knew something about taking a test, but then so did I. I didn't get 1500 on my SATs. You did. So you had an edge on me. But how was it that you were confident enough in your abilities that you said, yeah, we can take down Kaplan? Well, first, you know, just statistically, I mean, I used to run ads that said, friends don't let friends take Kaplan. So it was a little bit of a personal thing. But at the same time, the reality was that the average Prince Review student started 100 points above the average Kaplan student when you looked at our studies and improved more. So there was a significant gap. But it wasn't just about being a good student. It was an attitude towards the test. It was, this is all fun. And you could never use fun in any ads. But the experience should be that the people teaching me went to the schools I want to go to. We can talk about that. They know their material. They know their techniques. We really rigorously, I mean, we probably trained a math teacher just to teach SAP math, starting from really high scores, 25 hours just to teach one subject of a test prep course with the assumption, you know, having proven to us that they were scoring well with the 700s without anything. And the reason I was confident is the same reason I think my other companies have done well. The education space, it is impossible to persist. It's impossible to have a sustainable business unless you're actually doing a good job and utterly focused on the skills and content that you're supposed to be teaching and measuring how effective you are in teaching it and constantly refining your practice. And nobody else was really doing that. You looked at a test prep book back in the day and they would teach you how to do a synonym question. And there weren't even synonym questions on the test. Just nobody was paying attention. That is a great example. So you graduate from Princeton in 81. How did you go about starting your company? Did you have it in your head when you graduated that you were going to take on Kaplan? No, I actually worked on Wall Street for about six weeks and then realized that's just not going to happen. Why that's not? not fun. I hated wearing a suit. I hated going to an office every day to do things that had very little social impact. It just didn't seem like something I would enjoy doing. And I had my test prep background and just thought, you know, why don't we start this? And so I started it a couple months after I graduated, sent out a letter to the counselors at all the good schools and said, I'm, I'm going to be doing this. I think we're going to get some great results. And, you know, I'd love to have one of your students to prove what I can do. 
And by good schools, did you mean the high schools or the colleges? High schools. That you're a counselor at a good school, at a school sending students to selected colleges. And I want to show you that I would be the person to work with, that for any number of reasons, efficacy and experience and integrity, that we'd be good partners. We started with 15 students and the next semester we had 40 and the next one we had 100 and we just grew very, very quickly. And this was obviously before social media, before the internet. How did it grow? Was it purely word of mouth? It was largely word of mouth for the first several years and not a ton of advertising and marketing. And then actually something odd happened. The testing company, tired of being mocked by me and sure that if we were getting the kind of results we claimed that it must be because we were cheating, sent a bunch of investigators into my programs, found literally two handfuls of questions that had once appeared on an actual SAT that somehow would work their way into the materials out of thousands of questions that we used and sued us for copyright infringement and made a big deal out of it. I mean, they had 11 lawyers at the first hearing. They leaked it to every newspaper and media outlet and made it clear that they were going to shut us down and that our results were organized cheating. We got a great lawyer. We were getting our butts kicked because all of the papers in the case were sealed because the testing company insisted that there was a security problem, that if they published any of this, that they would help other people cheat. And so I couldn't, you know, I could say, look, this is about a handful of questions, none of which has ever reappeared on the test, none of which was circled. Make sure you learn this one. This is nothing. I couldn't make the case because I couldn't show them the papers. And I was meeting with the Times, who was going to run a piece on it. And I said that, and the reporter then says, well, this question looks pretty similar to the question that are in your materials. And he pulls out from under the desk pages from the lawsuit. I said, where did you get those? And he said, well, the testing company gave them to me. So we marched in to court. The judge released all the papers so that I could now defend myself. And we ran off, I don't know, 80 or 90 straight articles saying, why is ETS so worried about this little company? And we quadrupled enrollment overnight. It was probably the best advertising one could ever have done. Expensive, but effective. Yeah. So... About 17 years later, roughly, in 2008, you left the Princeton Review to found your second ed tech startup, which was named To You, or the opposite of the Irish band U2. My understanding is that it was one of the very first OPMs, and by that, it stands for Online Program Management, something John, I had never heard of before until I started prepping for our interview. So what is OPM? What are OPMs? And what does To You Do? Sadly, it was 27 years later that I left Princeton Review. So I did it a long time, took the company public, and finally realized I hated running a public company. And started To You, the original name of it was actually Tudor. It was number two T-O-R, named after my old dog, Tor but it got changed later on. And OPM, if you think about a university, the core of what makes Berkeley, Berkeley, or Tufts, Tufts, are the professors that it has brought together, the students it has admitted, and the intellectual property that they share. Everything else is support for that. And when you go online, that means you've got to build out a tech platform. You've got to create course materials that are engaging and interactive and collaborative. It means you've got to market and recruit students, support them all the way through the program, place them into internships and jobs. All of those services, when you go online and you've got students from all over the country and all over the world, None of your services, none of your support teams are ready for that. And so what we did is created a variety of teams to flank the core instructional mission of the university and say, let's build an online program. Let's scale it up. In no way should you take students who you wouldn't have taken in the classroom program, teach them well, support them well give them the same diploma as the classroom students, and let's prove that online education can be every bit as good as campus-based education, which we did. 
So as you said, colleges and universities and their professors, for that matter, are creating intellectual property that is unique to those professors and at that university or college. So what was it and what is it, I should say, that to you and other OPMs are doing with that intellectual property that is so special? Back in the day, the notion of taking that material and crafting a program, an online program with small classes, with a tremendous amount of student faculty engagement, replacing any lecture with modular, interactive, collaborative, adaptive teaching lessons, making it mobile. It hadn't been done. Like the online programs that existed were terrible. The schools that were doing them were terrible schools. And the belief was that this is just crap, that online education is just second rate. So it is harder than you think and more expensive than you think to really be thoughtful, to work with a professor for several months to say, this course that you've been giving for years, let's deconstruct it. In unit four, what are the key things that you're trying to teach? How are you measuring that the students have learned them? What are the best ways, the most engaging ways of getting that information out? So you're spending 100 hours of a professor's time. You're spending 50 or $100,000 of a instructional designer's time really thinking through how do we build something that is good. And you're not even replacing the whole course. You're just replacing the lecture part of it. And the hope is when students walk into class, which might be a Zoom session, you know, not unlike a Skype session, but a little clever. When you walk into class, the students are all ready for that class. There's no lecture to be given. There is discussion. There's problem sets. There is interaction of 12 or 13 students at a time. So you can see everybody's eyes when they're on the screen. And then when the class is over and you go back and you're doing things again on your own, doing everything we can to connect you to other students and connect you to the conversation, which is really what higher ed is about. So what does the professor get out of doing this, out of taking 100 hours out of their own day or their own free time? (laughs) Semester. Yeah. Right. That time to create the materials, to create the instructional design is in generally in lieu of teaching a class. So this semester, instead of teaching three classes, you'll teach two and you'll work with the instructional designer for the rest. In terms of the benefit, the thoughtfulness, I mean, a lot of professors, they're focused on their research. Teaching is something they do, but they've never really thought about exactly what do I want students to know? Exactly how am I measuring it? What are the ways of getting that across? And Then at the end of the semester, every semester, having data that says, well, here's what they actually learned. And here's when they learned it. Here was the arc of morale. You know, there was a class engaged. Were they happy? And were they learning? And every semester being able to say, you know, unit four, we can work on. We can make that better. We can take the weakest link in this course and replace it with something much better and continue to just iterate on the design of the course. So a real focus on the teaching itself is something a lot of them don't have the chance to do in this way with a whole team, with people really supporting you. Gotcha. So John, as we discussed at the outset, you felt as a new college graduate who had done incredibly well on the SATs and had been tutoring while you were in college, it felt like this was a familiar place for you to be in for your first company. How did you make that pivot from being in the testing world to being in the teaching world on an online platform? And what was it that you saw on the horizon that said to you, this should be my next business? So first, I was teaching when I was doing test prep, right? We were just teaching something very specific in terms of who are you? Where are you scoring? What are the kind of mistakes you're making? And how do we fix them? I still don't consider myself an educator, but I do consider myself thoughtful about How do we measure what we're teaching and how do we use technology to create a social construct and a interesting, engaging class? 
we at Princeton Review, we were one of the first hundred dot com websites. Like we were using technology very, very early on to try to help kids. And I was pretty familiar with the tools and the people. What I felt is that a test prep company can only be so big. Like it's a lovely space, but where do we go from here? And my answer was we really got to get involved in helping higher ed get this right, to get the use of technology right. I brought the idea actually to my board and said, this is where we should head. And they weren't interested in it and gave me the right to go off and start a new company, which which I then did. But I think the key, and not to ramble too much, the key to any business is not how much the CEO knows, but how much the management team knows. And I brought together people who were very good at the various facets of what we needed to do. I always find it fascinating to speak with people who are pioneers in an area that is ubiquitous today, right? I think it's about roughly half of colleges, community colleges, public and private universities now offer online courses and use OPMs. Does that sound about right to you? Many, many don't use OPMs. The majority of programs are homegrown. The majority of good programs and the majority of students taking those programs are supported by OPMs. Okay. So, Why is an OPM better than a homegrown? Well, first of all, there are real problems with the OPM market. And I turned around years after leaving to you to create a new company that I think addresses some of those problems. It's sort of a next generation OPM called Noodle. So before we get into Noodle, I just want to first understand why there is a distinction between the homegrown and the OPM, and then we can talk about Noodle. In almost every category of instructional design or marketing or technology, the programs that the schools generate are almost always underfunded, almost always insular. And the fact is that they have no economies of scale. You know, I can build programs, I can build technology stacks for dozens of universities, negotiate better prices, craft how technologies all work together in really thoughtful ways, and I can defray that cost across the whole network, and they have to do it for themselves. A school we were working with, the way they taught a particular social work problem is they would give students a 15-page brief, read all about this woman, Natalie and then come to class ready to discuss. And we took that brief, turned it into a script with a good screenwriter, passed it by the professor, made his changes and approved it. We then hired actors and created a series of short movies, in effect. And when a student watched that movie, which was A, about Natalie's life, but B, watching her with a social worker kind of do a back and forth, so modeling the actual interaction. And followed by, this is the report that a social worker would fill out after that meeting. And so now when you walk into class, the professor can see, here's when they watched the video, what they thought about it, can pull together the data and have a discussion of people who really understand this woman better and are much more prepared to talk about it. And then you take that and put it back into the classroom program. So you're not just transforming the online program, but you're changing the practice of the campus space program. But, you know, boom, you know, $25,000 just disappeared. And an awful lot of very smart people's time of screenwriters and actors and camera people and editors all around this professor's ideas. And we do that all the time of what's the best way to get it across. And now, like, let's assemble an army and actually do it. So, John, let me ask you this question, because in this day and age, right, you can find almost anything online. Couldn't you also be a little scrappier or that professor be a little scrappier and Google a video of a real social worker having a case and working in that case and pull something off YouTube or pull something off another part of the Internet? This may not be a great example for that, but is it necessary? What you're describing is exactly right. A professor could could do that if she were really thoughtful and she could turn out something that feels kind of scrappy and pulled together. But you're going to some of the best colleges or universities in the country. And what else do they do like that? Of just things are kind of thrown together. We're not going to build a dorm. We're just going to, 
you know, send those kids to the Holiday Inn down the street and we're going to do like the notion that you're paying money for professionals to do a really thoughtful job. Just knowing the numbers, knowing exactly like if there's some good video out there, the first job of the instructional designer is to find it. And that's something they are far better equipped to do than the professor is, right? Or working together are far more equipped than the professor alone. So if there is something really, really good, you certainly want to use it and not recreate it. But holy cow, a lot of times there is a sense of instruction's a real thing. And it should be done with the same thoughtfulness and rigor as anything else at a great university, anything else at a great company. This is what we do. I want to make sure I understand you. Did you say that this is the case at some of the great institutions? And even at the great institutions, you can't expect professors in preparing for online courses to do this kind of scrappy preparation to try to make online classes more compelling. You know, there are movies made with a handheld camera and just people kind of going around. But most successful movies, somebody spent a fair amount of money and time and effort, found a bunch of top professionals and really worked it. And I don't know why good instruction that was scrappily put together by someone who has no expertise, like you're a psychologist, you're an engineer, you're an architect, you're a business person. Where's your expertise in the pedagogy and in the technology to scrappily put together something on your own? That's just not a thing. That's like saying, you know, anybody can make a movie. They just, you know, go and pull together some stuff. (laughs) Why would you do? Who wants to watch your movie? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I guess I was thinking about it in terms of if I were teaching, that's what I would do. But you're absolutely right. If you're teaching a more obscure, for whatever reason, you don't necessarily have that mindset to go out and make it compelling to watch on the screen of your computer. Even if you did. And again, it's not about watching, right? Good instructional design is not a passive thing. It's not like a movie. It is an interactive, collaborative experience. Some of the stuff we create actually doesn't look great, but it prompts the kind of behaviors that we want to prompt. It gets people talking to each other. It gets people engaged with the material. I'll give you an example where you can do something less expensively but still really well. The situation I described of putting together a simulation as a problem, A, it's really expensive, but B, the problem is that now I learn what students do. I learn what they say and I realize that, boy, you know, I could make it that much more compelling. I could craft the narrative a little bit differently, except that the actors are a year older, they've cut their hair or moved, and editing working that into something that looks good every year becomes harder. So one of the things we're doing now to keep costs down, but to gain that flexibility is turning simulations into graphic novels. So it still is highly interactive. There's still a back and forth with audio and with documents to read and everything. But if I need to change a panel inexpensively, I can put together a left turn where before there was a right turn and it still feels great and it's less expensive so I can do more of them. Again, none of that is something that a professor knows how to do or has the time to do. They're paid to do research and they're paid to teach students. They're not paid to become instructional designers. Got it. Now, I had said in the introduction to this episode that you were going to crack the code for our young listeners, if they aren't already aware, why the cost of tuition has gone up so much over Mm -hmm. the last 20, 30 years. And without giving it away, one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons is because of the OPMs. Can you just very quickly explain that, John, before we get into what the Noodle Companies is doing? A lot of why college is more expensive now is just a policy thing. The state used to pay 75% of the cost of sending somebody to college, and now we pay 25% of the cost. We've decided as a country to reduce our role in getting everybody a college education. At the same time, I think that it is hard to educate more and more people who have completely different backgrounds 
and in many cases need more support as efficiently as just educating the top couple percent of white rich guys. So colleges have been struggling with costs for a long time. Technology has a chance to make it better. And we can make higher ed half as expensive as it is right now without screwing it up. So I understand that state colleges, universities are now the average student is paying much more. But what about private institutions? Their tuition has also skyrocketed. It has. And some part of that is real. And some part of it is the decision to raise tuition every year and take the new money and put it back into financial aid. For the last 15 years, the cost of higher ed has actually been flat to inflation. It's actually the same price people are really paying. The average freshman right now is paying half of the sticker price of college. So every year we make it sound more scary and it works. People are horrified at tuitions. And it turns out we're not actually raising the price. We're just raising the price for rich kids and lowering the price for poor kids. And what about the relationship between the online program management companies and these universities? OPMs typically take anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the online tuition, whatever the revenue is, and the universities get the rest. How is that playing into the cost of tuition, both online and on campus? In every other sector, technology has come in to lower costs, to make things more efficient. Here, we could use technology as a way to artfully create better experiences and less expensive ones. Instead, the OPMs are making a lot of money on a student. You know, an MBA student paying $100,000 of tuition, $30,000 of that is the profit of the OPM, right? So it's tough to keep costs down when crazy amounts of money are going to Wall Street. So my feeling is that OPMs are actually making online education more expensive, where what we should be doing is making both online and on campus education less expensive without making that at the cost of student faculty interactions and engagement. So I guess that brings us to your latest venture, John, Noodle Companies. What is it and how is it different or similar to you, the OPM that you started back in 2008 and the online program management that was being done there? So I had a crazy idea when I left to you that I would start a studio and there would actually be several operating companies solving different problems in education under the umbrella of Noodle. One of those companies is Noodle Partners and we are a next generation online program manager, an OPM. And our thought experiment is, can we create great online programs with great universities but save universities 25 or 30% on tuition and then help them give that money back to students. In other words, can technology help universities lower the cost of higher ed? And so far, so good. We're working with two dozen of the best universities in the country. We're growing our programs double and triple every year, and we're starting to get the kind of efficiencies that really are impact tuitions. So... It sounds like EdTech could be a business for our young listeners who may be interested in education. What advice do you have, John, for those young people who may want to break into this industry? How can they make themselves more competitive candidates? I would say take a data science course or two that understanding data is really, really useful. And I think not just in ed tech, but in a lot of tech companies. And jump in. The students we hire and the 20-somethings we hire at Noodle have all kinds of backgrounds from all kinds of majors, all kinds of universities. What brings us together is we love the problem. If it is really exciting to you, if you would be psyched to come in every morning, to get out of bed every morning because you're going to make education better, then it's a great sector. It's a lot of work. You really do feel like you're making change. John, what trend do you see on the horizon, if any, 
that you think our young listeners should be aware of in terms of where this industry is going? There are three things to think about. One, there is an enormous number, billions of people who are joining the middle class across Asia and hundreds of millions more in developed countries who didn't used to go to college and now can. The demand is only going to get higher. Further, the changes in the economy caused by robotics, caused by globalization and AI, the workplace is going to evolve increasingly quickly and the need for life learning, the need to continue to learn is only going to get higher. So you take those two things, it's a tremendous tailwind for education. Can we take that new demand and service it with institutions that are efficient, inexpensive, agile, we can meet you where you want to learn, what you want to learn. And that's what the ed tech sector is largely focused on. So I promised our young listeners that I would ask you for those who may not yet be in college, John, and may be thinking about going to college, whether online or on campus. Why shouldn't they do what you and I were advised to do when we were applying to schools to pick your rich schools and your safety schools and the ones that you think you'll be able to get into? What is it that they should be doing differently? And I just want to let our listeners know that that is not just some random person breathing heavy. That is your dog (laughs) that is right next to you. Am I right? (laughs) You are right. I'm trying to keep him from barking. He's getting ready for dinner. Yes. Uh, It turns out that most people think it's much harder to get into a great university than it was 30 years ago. The reality is it's much easier. You know, if you take the top 100 universities in the country, the number of spots in the freshman class for Americans, we're getting international students and there are more of them than there used to be. But the number of spots for American students is up by 45% over the past 30 years. The number of 17-year-olds graduating from high school who, or 18-year-olds, who are ready for a top education, who have reasonable grades and scores, is up 5 or 10%. Just numerically, you've got 45% more spots for 5 or 10% more students. It's just easier. It looks harder because the admissions process has changed. It used to be about reaches and safeties in in exactly the way you're saying. There used to be a matchmaker connecting you to the right school. And now it's more like Tinder. There are a whole bunch of good schools. You're going to apply to many more of them than students did back in the day. The average student now sends out three times as many applications as a student back then because of electronic applications and the Common App. But all of these schools are therefore that much more selective. And any one school... You've just tripled the number of applicants and you're playing games with yield management and early decision to try to lower the number of students you're taking. So it seems as if schools are more selective. They're not. In the same way that dating, you know, back in the day, there's a matchmaker. It's my son, your daughter, it's Matt, and that's it. You're going to date one person and you're going to marry 100% of those people. And now you're going to swipe left and right. You're going to date 100 people. And you're going to marry one out of the hundred. And the person you marry will have dated a hundred people and same odds. It's not more selective. It's just different. Overall, it's an easier process if you understand it at all. And you recommend that they go for the early decision, right? They absolutely should go for early decision. At this point, a lot of schools, half the students are going to take are coming in early. So there are two bites at the apple. Why would you only play in one of those two games when you can play in both of them. The other thing about the admissions world as it is now, past a certain level of test score and a certain level of grades that are, you know, that are solid. It's not how colleges are making decisions. A student with a 3.7 is not a better applicant than a student with a 3.6. That's not what it's about. Once a selected college has decided, yeah, you can handle the work here. What they're really thinking about is how do I fill my class? I need a certain number of athletes for the football team. I need a certain number of engineers. I need some balance between male and female, between different ethnicities or different geographies. I'm not St. Peter at the gate. I'm a casting director. I need a tall guy with white hair to play Uncle Bob. I need a short fat kid to play Billy. Like It's not about the five (laughs) best actors. It's about a cast. It's about an ensemble. It's really important because people think you know, if they kill themselves, 
and take a zillion really difficult courses, APs or whatever, and they study like crazy to get a perfect score on the test, that it matters. And past a certain point, it doesn't matter at all. What does matter is that you pursue your passion, that if you love journalism, that you're out there writing stories or interning for some local newspaper or radio show or blog. If you love art, that you're doing art and that you're taking it seriously because somebody who has pursued a passion, they might get to college and say, well, I'm done with that, but they'll find another passion. Once you've been down that road and you're not a tourist anymore and you're really having intense conversations with other people who really love this stuff, like it's intoxicating. You will become passionate about something else. And if I'm a college admissions officer and I'm thinking, boy, here's somebody who never became passionate. All they've done is robot-like, get grades and scores and done some extra curriculums because I think it looks good on the application. I have no idea if they'll develop a passion here. I have no idea if they're going to leave a footprint on this school at all. So it's about differentiation in this world that's more tenderized. So the college admissions process, it's not harder. It's just different. That was such a great explanation, John. Thank you so much. I have two final time for coffee questions. These are questions I try to ask all of my guests. Could you share a time in your professional life when you really struggled? It would be super easy for anybody listening to this episode, for anyone who Googles John Katzman to say, wow, that guy has the Midas touch. Have you hit a wall? Have you nosedive? Have you face planted? Have you ever failed? And if you have, what is a lesson that you learned in the process? Two things. One, I fail all the time. And I find it's mostly when I get arrogant. If you stop listening, stop paying attention, it's not going to go well. My brother taught me a long time ago, sometimes when everybody says you're wrong, it's because you're wrong. And I sometimes listen to that advice. And when I don't, I get in trouble. And what do I do about it when I get there? In almost every case, the answer to things going wrong is do fewer things, is simplify, focus on what's important, let everything else go. Got it. So final time for coffee question, John. If you could go back to college, back to Princeton and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? If I had college to do over again, I, and I really enjoyed college, but I got much less out of it than I might have. There are plenty of ways to waste time. There are more than there were back then, but there were plenty back then. And they fill whatever time you leave them. The notion of playing a sport, getting involved in some extracurricular that's exciting, doing an internship, the correlation between people's life happiness and their educational experience is, do you end up with a relationship with a professor? Even one. It doesn't have to be every professor, but the students who ended up doing research with some professor, ended up doing an internship someplace. They got more out of school and they get more out of life. So are you saying if you had it to do over again, you would have developed a deep relationship with a professor or did you do that? I did not do a deep internship when I was in school and I think I should have. I, I played lacrosse, which was great. And I went to the mall and I hung out with friends and it was great. I think intellectually, there could have been more. I studied with an incredible professor who was a former head of the New York City Planning Commission and who was perfectly willing to give me more time to really understand how cities work, and I didn't take advantage of it. John, I want to thank you so much for letting me take advantage of your wisdom and your expertise and insights into this really fascinating field. You've been so generous with your time. I want to thank you sincerely for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. It was so good of you to have me. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee. 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much. <laughs>